Our next speaker uh, is Andrew Bates, who's from the Centre of Dairy Excellence, uh, Vet Life New Zealand. And, and this study is done in cooperation with the uh, Department of Microbiology and Immunology in the University of Otago. Uh, the subject of the talk is diagnosis of subclinical infection with mycobacterium avium, per tuberculosis and an effect on milk production. Good. Good morning, and um, I'd just like to say thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to be here and also to acknowledge my colleagues Rory, Simon and Frank who have really done all the clever work in developing the diagnostics which we then as a practice used as a pilot project to try and see whether we could get better control of Yoni's disease on an endemically infected herd and also whether we could quantify the costs of that subclinical infection. I'm having trouble too. Next please. Yep, thank you. So, do we have a new uh, Yoni's problem in um, New Zealand? Well, we haven't tested great numbers of cows for sort of fairly practical reasons, but we have had a couple of recent surveys of farmers to try and estimate the prevalence and the incidence on those farms. And currently, we think we have about a 60% herd prevalence, slightly higher in the South Island in the dairy sector, and we're running at about one case per 333 cow years um, for clinical disease. In fact, Relatively few herds have more than one case per 200 cows a year. So like most of the world, we have a lot more infection than disease. But this picture is probably giving us a very false sense of security, because it is based on farmer estimation, which is inevitably based on clinical disease. And so there's probably a lot more subclinical infection going on behind that. So what are we doing about it? Well, we don't have a subsidized control program, not as yet, but we do have the benefit of the JDRC, the Research Consortium. It's an industry-funded and led body which attempts to basically put educational and extension tools into the public domain for vets and farmers to better control yonis. And in 2015, our Livestock Improvement Corporation, through their herd testing um, scheme, are now running a test for, a uh, for yonis. They take a milk sample from every cow and they pull them into pools of eight and they test them. And if you get a positive pool, then all the members of that pool are retested with a higher sensitivity. And that's currently what was, is, is available. And we have some good recommendations from JDRC, which is essentially about trying to identify where the infection is coming from and then making sure that you get rid of it and that it doesn't spread into the young stock. So very much in line with what people have been saying here already. The issue that we have is that on large herds, it's quite hard to put those into place when we can't identify who's infected. So why this farm? Well, to some extent, it was born out of frustration that we weren't able to better give advice to farmers to try and control this situation as we were. So the farm we chose was a reasonably average South Canterbury spring calving farm, and we set this process off in spring 2013. He was culling 3 to 5% of the herd annually for suspected Yoni's disease. So these are cows that are either clinically scouring or close enough that he was confident that that's why they were going. He tried some limited testing a few years ago and it hadn't been that effective. He'd run out of steam basically for a variety of reasons. But the situation was getting worse. And with a new farm team on board and with some new technology coming from Frank and his group, we felt that we might be able to make a difference. And we started in spring 2013, remember, so we had no uh, milk testing available through LIC. So, this has been covered extremely well already this morning, and I've only really put it in um, to try and make sure that I remember what we were trying to do. And essentially, what we're trying to do with the testing methodology that Frank's come up with is to push back the point at which we can detect subclinically infected cows. We felt that if we can pull more of them out of the herd faster, we would have a better chance of decreasing the infection spread through the herd, and we would also decrease those subclinical and clinical losses. So what we wanted to do was essentially protect that newborn calf, all the way from when it's first born, right the way through to its two-year-old calving down for the first time, because that seems to be the key period of risk for these animals. We wanted to reduce the losses from clinical culls. That was a big motivator for the farmer. He was really fed up with seeing 50 cows going down the road every year. We wanted to reduce the losses from the subclinical disease, and we wanted to reduce that infectious pressure. So we wanted to identify infectious animals that were fecally positive, but we also wanted to identify the infected animals, the blood positives. So how does testing help? Essentially, this is the way I think of it as a working vet. Essentially, what we're doing with the testing is we're getting rid of the worst. And then what's left, we divide into keepers and sleepers. And keepers are animals that are currently test negative in both tests. And sleepers are animals that we can't get yet 
get rid of yet because we can't afford to, but they are positive to one or more tests. And we do different things with those. So what we're doing is we're currently testing a culling, and every year we're doing it so far, and we're just about to carry out the third year's test in the next week or so. Young stock are reared off the farm, which is good, and he doesn't purchase any cows. We're trying hard on the calving and colostrum management, but it's been a lot harder battle. So the testing, we do four um, ELISA tests in parallel. And by doing that, we greatly increase the sensitivity of the testing. Animals that are positive to any one of those tests get a fecal sample taken, and we do a quantitative fecal PCR on that cow. So we divide those ELISAs into four groups, and essentially they're either not detected or they're positive, and we divide the positives into low, moderate, and highs. All the low, moderate, and highs get a poo sample, and then we divide those fecals into not detected, moderates, or highs. So we get a fair bit of information about the status of individual cows from this. And what, we, what did we find? In the first year, 26% of the herd were ELISA positive in one shape or form. In the second year, we'd reduced it to 10%. There's no particular clever technology in that. We just chopped heads off by identifying who was infected and getting rid of them. All these animals, though, were clinically normal. When we culled them, the farmer took some convincing that they had to go. We looked at which cows become ELISA positive. And essentially, like other people have found, we found that if you get older, you're more likely to be blood positive. We also found, though, that ELISA status does change year on year. Some go up, which you'd expect, but some come down, and that worried me for a while, so I had a look at it. So this is a graph showing you what happened to the cows that were ELISA high in 2014, what happened to them in 2015. So you can see that we culled quite a few up here, and quite a few stayed high. But about 20% of them went not detected the following year. And the same thing happened with cows that were moderate in 2014. We culled quite a few, and quite a few went high. But about 30% this time went not detected the following year. So I worried about this. I thought, are we missing cows, or are we diagnosing the wrong kind of cows? So this is trying to show what happens, what the status of those high flip-flop cows are. These are cows that go from high to low. And the cows that were high in 2014 that subsequently went low, normally you'd expect high ELISA cows to be um, fecally positive. But over 95% of these animals were not fecally positive, even though they were high. The flip-flop cows were different. The following year, they were not fecally positive, and you'd expect that because they're now low. So what I think this means is that we might miss infected animals, but we're not missing infectious, and that's quite reassuring from the control point of view. What does it do to production? All these cows were clinically normal. And I've got to apologize here, I've done this slide, the next one coming up in kilograms of milk solids. So you have to make that adjustment if you don't mind in your heads as to what the production level is, but it's quant it's, it's, you can extrapolate it. So here we've got the graph from the model. Um, we, that what the effect of ELISA status is going to be on milk production. This is ELISA status on its own. And we have the cows on the left here are the not detected groups, just under 500 kilos of milk solids. The low moderates are 39 kilograms less a year, and the highs are 65 kilograms less a year. And again, this is very much in line with some international studies. Fecal PCR testing. Now remember, we didn't test every, fecal pos uh, every cow for fecal positive. We only did the ones that were ELISA positives. So we're just numbers in these slides. So the first year, we had about 55 cows that were fecally positive. In the second year, we have 28. Again, all clinically normal. What does it do to milk production? Again, from the model, this is the marginal prediction of, of fecal PCR status. And it's just looking at fecal PCR status. And it's a 60, oh, 46 kilograms difference. Okay, now, many of these cows would be ELISA positive as well, so you have to add those two effects to get the true effect. OK, which cows are fecally positive? Again, logistic model to have a look at that. Age was not significant in that, and that again is consistent. But fecal PCR status doesn't change year on year. It doesn't flip-flop. But ELISA status was a very reliable predictor of fecal positivity, and you expect it would be. You were 24 times more likely to be poo positive if you're, if you're ELISA positive in the same year. And you're five times more likely to be fecally positive next year if you're ELISA positive this year. And I think that's to do with that flip-flopping where some high ELISA cows then go low. So can we determine the ELISA test performance? Well, not from this set of work, no. It's one farm, and we deliberately took a farm with a high herd prevalence. We, only took, we took blood samples from every cow, but we only took fecals from a few cows, so we can't really do it. But we do have access to a much larger data, larger data set, which is currently being written up, 
And it looks from that that the ELISA, the combined ELISA test, those four tests in parallel, is giving us a very high sensitivity and a good specificity, which we then follow up with a fecal. But remember, this is a high prevalence herd, and so the value of this process will very much depend on how much infection you've got as to how many false positives you'll end up with from the ELISA testing. So, to wrap it up, year on year, we're getting fewer blood positives and fewer fecal shedders. And we've still got a happy farmer, even in the downturn. He's still doing this work. There is a significant production cost from those subclinical infections, and that was reassuring because it meant that the cost of doing this process was easier to justify. We believe that the double testing combines a good high um, ELISA sensitivity with a high specificity for the fecals. So I think we find most, and most of the ones we find are genuine. Culling has been very straightforward on this farm. It's been easy to persuade the farmer to do it, but um, getting him to do the colostrum and calf ring has been much harder. Yep, okay, now I'm good. Um, do we need to do more frequent testing? Um, with that antibody flip-flopping around, I know um, in, in other countries in the EU, they're testing three or four times a year, and I think that would be a definite improvement. So I'm wrapping up now. I'd just like to thank all the farmers and the staff that were involved. I'd like to thank my colleagues at VetLife who were involved taking those poo samples and bleeding the cows. DRL have been great to work with and have been very supportive of this process. And I'd like to thank AgriHealth New Zealand who helped me get here. And you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. I think it's a lot of potential for Yoni's disease control in Ireland. Uh, if you've one quick question, if you make yourself to the, the microphone, and I might ask a quick one while I'm waiting. Um, the off-farm rearing, what percentage of your clients would do the off-farm rearing of the calves, and at what age do you take them to the off-farm? Okay, off most, most calves will be reared on farm until they're weaned, um, and basically we're calving in August uh, September, October, and so they'll be on farm usually till about December, and then they'll go away usually to runoffs. So it's not that uncommon in the, in the South Island with large herds to have heifers reared off, off farm. In the North Island with smaller units, it's much more common the other way around, and often you'll have calves keeping on the milk platform. We may see that change with the change in payout because people are looking at destocking and trying to reduce their costs, and so some people are bringing calf rearing back to the home platform to reduce rearing costs in that way. But they would be on the, on the home farm for the first They are for the first, yeah. first while, and that's one area where we've really struggled to get control. Um, hi, sorry. Um, Anita McNamara from North Queensland in Australia. I was just wondering, um, I might have missed it what time you said that you were actually taking the samples, if you were doing it once a year, whether if you took it sort of post-carving in an immune-suppressed cow, whether you're more likely to yeah. pick up positives? No, we tested in the autumn. Um, for a combination of reasons. One of the main ones, if I'm honest, was practicality. In the spring, it's just really hard logistically in a working practice to get enough people and the farmer to be happy to do it um, because everything's really busy because of the seasonal calving pattern. Um, so we do it in the autumn, which gives him the opportunity to get rid of those cows before the autumn cull takes place. We might be missing a few, I agree, because we're, you, know, you get more positives in the spring. Is that it? Right, thanks very much. Oh, Could we you. give Andrew another round of applause and he'll be down in the corner after the...